Jesus is enough. Greetings in his name. I'm Derek Lewandowski, one of the pastors at Redeeming Hope. Welcome to the digital stream of our Sunday message as we continue our series, our new series, God at Home. And the title of today's message is Friends. We're going to talk about being friends at home and how to process this idea of friendship as we build friendships in and out of the home. I'm in Galatians chapter 4, verses 15 through 20. I'm reading out of the ESV. Paul writes in this epistle to the church in Galatia. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to learn in this text uh, what it means to be a friend, what it means to be a friend to others, and, and what we are to look for uh, in building a culture of friendship in our homes, a culture of friendship in the church, and what we're to look for as we seek others to be our friends. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Three questions from this text that I believe we can answer from this text. Number one, what is a friend? Biblically, what is a friend? Number two, who are your friends? And number three, who is your best friend? So what is a friend? We're going to define it. Uh, who are your friends? In other words, where should we be looking for our friends? And then number three, who's our, who's our best friend? Let's talk about, the, about this idea of what is a friend? Paul shows us here in this text what a true friend is. Legalistic, false teachers had come into the church that he founded, and they were so persuasive that many of the Christians there were deceived by their teaching. And this broke Paul's heart. Look at how Paul talks to them in verse 17. He says, They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may, that you may make much of them. He's saying, They're not your friends. They want your praise, but they don't have your best interests in mind. They want you to look up to them, but they're using you. Have you ever had a friend like that? You find out in the end that they don't truly love you, but love what you can provide for them, what you can give to them, maybe status or you know, some emotional support that they're looking for, popularity, codependency, or, or something else. But they're not really your friends. They have a they have a selfish agenda or desire in the relationship. Verse 18. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. Paul's saying, it's a good thing if someone makes much of you for a good reason, because they love you. They admire your faith or character, etc. He says, that's good, but that's not what these people are. They're not making much of you for a good reason. They want you to make much of them, he says. Verse 19, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul here abandons the theological arguments he was making earlier in the book where he was eviscerating their false gospel and now he appeals to the heart. He says he's in anguish. He's now coming to them as a father. He was their spiritual father and as a friend. You know, as a father, if... You know, if, if, if your kids are playing out in the yard and you look out in the yard and see, you know, I guess here in T Tennessee, coyotes coming and attacking your children, man, you are going to be righteously angry. You're going to go out there and you're going to defend your kid. And, and that's the same instinct that's rising up in Paul, the apostle here. He's, he hears this report of these false teachers who had come in and were saying, to be saved, you got to keep the law of Moses, starting with circumcision these Jewish false teachers. He says, that's not the gospel. He's, he calls them wolves. These wolves had come in and he's appealing to them now. He's in anguish over them. He's appealing to them as a father and a friend to come back to the grace of God. So what is a true friend? Number one, a true friend is someone that has a vision for your spiritual health and your spiritual future. Unlike the false teachers who just wanted their praise, Paul has a vision for the Galatian believers that includes their spiritual health 
and their spiritual future, their spiritual formation. He says, I want Christ to be formed in you. He had a vision for this beautiful spiritual future for them. Listen to this quote, and then I'll explain it. They did not know that they had killed their best friends. They did not know that they had killed their best friends. John Patton, missionary to the New Hebrides. That was in his autobiography, the autobiography of John Patton, this missionary to the far islands of the New Hebrides. He was speaking of the early missionaries who were martyred at the hands of the island tribes. Patton calls these martyrs the best friends of the ones who murdered them. Why? Because these missionaries had nothing but the good of the islanders in their hearts and minds. And he says they did not know when they slaughtered them on the beach that they had killed their best friends. Because a true friend has a vision for your spiritual health and your spiritual future. Number two, a true friend understands what we're going to call the ministry of truth and the ministry of tears. In this text, we see that. We see truth and tears. A friend knows when one ought to tell the truth and when one ought to come alongside and comfort and weep. Verse 16, Paul says, Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? There's truth. There's a ministry of truth. Verse 19, the ministry of tears. My little children, for whom I am again in, in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. One moment he's challenging them with the truth. One moment he's weeping. And here's the thing. If we use the ministry of truth when it's time for the ministry of tears, people get hurt. But if we use the ministry of tears when it's time to use the ministry of truth, people get hurt. We see this in this very book, the book of Galatians. Two chapters before this, when Paul, the apostle Paul, and Peter, one of the apostles, Christ's disciples, have a public confrontation. The false teachers taught that Gentile believers needed to be circumcised like the Jews in order to be saved. Paul taught against this, teaching that we're saved by grace, not by works, not by the law. But at church meals, Peter was pulling away from the Gentile Christians and only eating with the Jewish false teachers, the circumcision group. And Paul said in Galatians 2 that even Barnabas was led astray and ate with the Jews. Barnabas, you may know, is a New Testament character whose name means the son of consolation or the son of encouragement. In other words, Barnabas was gifted at the ministry of tears. Paul said in Galatians 2 that he confronted Peter to his face in front of the whole church at one of these meals, and he called Peter back to the gospel of grace. And his public rebuke seems to have sown grace seems to have saved the church, and it seems to have rescued Peter from drifting into that. So here's what we need to see. What the Galatian church needed was the ministry of truth in that moment, not the ministry of tears. Barnabas, in his compassion and not wanting to reject his own people, perhaps, fell on the wrong side. And here's what's crazy, is that if Paul didn't speak up, Barnabas would have split the church with his tears, what the church needed was truth. And Paul was being a true friend to his own discomfort by telling the truth. And he also knew how to show compassion and how to weep. Is someone a friend who won't tell you the truth? You know, if, if you have someone in your life who all they want to hear from you is yes all the time, and they don't want, to, they don't want you to be honest with them, are you really friends? If they're not honest with you, if you're not honest with them, you know, I watched this show on TV called Intervention. It's actually a pretty heartbreaking, uh, riveting, like uh, documentary reality uh, show as it just chronicles the story of an alcoholic or an addict that's confronted by their family and friends who ask them to seek help. Isn't that love? Isn't that love that's willing to do that, that's willing to, to, to break through the barriers of, of discomfort and and the, the, the painful uh, process, the painful experience that that would be to put yourself in the fire like that and say to them, I love you, but I hate what this is doing to you. I hate how it's destroying your life. I hate how it's destroying your relationships. And I want you to get help and get better. That's love. That's the ministry of truth. We speak the truth to one another in love. But then there's times when we come along when someone is broken 
and someone needs tears and someone needs that, that comfort as well. And so that's a true friend, understands the ministry of truth and the ministry of tears. And finally, number three, a true friend sees your flaws and gives you grace. Proverbs 17, 9. One who forgives an affront fosters friendship, but one who dwells on disputes alienates a friend. Colossians 3 sort of echoes the teaching of Jesus about forgiveness. When it says this, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And so typical of uh, Paul's writings, typical of how um, the commands are given in the New Testament, that you're commanded to do something, but at the same time remember what's been done for you and what's, what's been done in you and what's been done for you. Forgive as Christ forgave you. So remember the gospel. Remember how you were forgiven, and that helps you forgive others. Remember your own brokenness. Remember your own, uh, your own flaws, and that will help you with others and their flaws. You know, Heidi and I had a new friend, a church friend, come over to our house some years back when we lived in New York. We cleaned up and made our home look good for the night together. But one thing I, I, I didn't want this person to see was my garage. Because my garage was just, it was just a, a, a dumping site of everything extra in my home that we didn't have a place for. So we made our house look good, but when she came over with the kids, she arrived when I'd been working on our garage which had become this sort of catch-all dumping site for everything we had no place for. And the door was open, and all of a sudden I heard her voice, hello? Oh, so embarrassed when I walked out and realized that she'd arrived before I could shut the door. She looked around, and she seemed unfazed. And we ended up having a great night together, and she became part of our church for a long time. You know, I think that's a picture of, of biblical friends. She saw the worst part of our house and didn't reject me. That's a picture of friendship. You know the worst part of someone else and you love them anyway. You give them grace where they are weak. Your spouse, uh, your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ, you've seen the worst and yet you love them the most. Is this any more true than in the home, any more needed than in the home, between spouses, between parents and children? Who knows the weakness of the other more than family members? When we see the worst parts of someone's life, the worst parts of their character, and love them anyway, they're a true friend. One of my mentors once told me, I know someone is my friend when I've let them down greatly and they haven't abandoned me. So a true friend has a vision for your spiritual health. A true friend tells you the truth and shows you compassion. A true friend sees your flaws and gives you grace. Now, kids in here, Teens. I know, you know you're in a season when friends are, are, uh, are very important. You know, fr friends, the, the role that friends have in your life uh, is a very important thing to you. But if somebody doesn't fit this grid, what you have to realize is they might not be your friend at all. A true friend is someone who has a vision for your spiritual health and future. They tell you the truth in love and show you compassion. They see your flaws and give you grace. If someone doesn't fit that grid, they might not be your friend and you might need to pull back from that relationship. Parents, if someone doesn't fit this grid in the lives of your children, you can help your children choose their friends and avoid the wrong friends because choosing the wrong friends can be extremely destructive. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. So choose friends that have a vision for your spiritual health. Choose friends that tell you the truth and show you compassion. Choose friends that see your flaws and give you grace and be that kind of a friend to others. So that's what a friend is. That's what a biblical friend is. Now, who are our friends? Well, let's go back to the text here. Actually, in a bigger, kind of a, a broader way, pull back from the text and look at the book of Galatians. The church in Galatia. Paul has no family but the church, especially the churches that he founded. He had no friends but the church. And let's look at how these friends came into his life. And uh, we see an example of that uh, in, his, in his missionary journeys that are chronicled in the book of Acts. Paul planted the church in Galatia on his first missionary journey. He, he was sent out of the church in Antioch. 
And here's how the book of Acts describes what Paul experienced everywhere he preached the gospel and planted churches. This was, what I'm about to read, was early on the same missionary journey where he ended up in a place called Pisidian Antioch, and he founded a church there. Started a church that preached the gospel, started a church. And Acts 16, 13, 48 says this, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. This tells us that God moved the hearts of those who believed in Christ. God moved their hearts toward him and toward Paul. My point is this. God gave Paul his friends, and God will give you yours. Look at what the Lord has done here at Redeeming Hope, if you're a member at Redeeming Hope and listening to this, to this recording. You know, I hardly knew most of you a year ago, but God's brought our lives together around the gospel. He's moved our hearts toward him and toward one another. And that's the church. The church, the word church literally means called out ones. It's, we're the called out ones. Jesus calls us together and gives us one another. And we're in this series, God at Home. Our home should be a place of friendship. God has sovereignly put you and your family with the people that are in your family, with your brothers and sisters in your family. He gave you your family. And though it takes work, we can be friends. We can be great friends in our families. We have a vision for one another's spiritual health. We speak the truth in love. We see one another's flaws and give grace and practice forgiveness. Practically, this means we spend time together. Sometimes we put cell phones down. We do the things that build friendships. Spouses, I want to encourage you to model this to your children. Pursue friendship in your marriage. Be an example of humility, repentance, and forgiveness. Fathers, choose your children. Pick the same hobbies of your children that they pick. Then you have more time together. You don't have to, to do your hobby. You don't have to leave your family and leave your kids. Uh, one note to fathers, uh, just something that I think is worthy of consideration. Fathers, a mother naturally has her daughter's heart, it seems, that oftentimes the daughter is drawn to her mom. But often a father has to earn your daughter's heart. And I want to encourage you to pursue your daughters. Pursue them by spending time with them, uh, by engaging that relationship and being affectionate and giving them that fatherly love. Mothers, continue, continue to build family memories and help tie those heartstrings together. Kids, don't make an idol out of your friends outside the family. But lean into your family. I'm not saying you can't have friends outside your home, but lean into your family. Because the truth is, 99% of your friends outside the home will be gone in five years. You know who won't be gone? Your siblings. I've told my children that when they're older, I want them to care for each other to go out of their way to spend time together and to grow toward one another, not away from each other. I don't mean geographically, I mean relationally. We've all seen family disputes that divide, sometimes for years. You know, in my, in my family, one of my uncles lived next to another uncle. And they both had uh, beachfront property. And um, the daughter, my, my cousin of, of, from one family, went and rode the, uh, her ATV through the water on uh, the other uncle's side in, on their beach. Oh man, they were so upset at her and they, they lost, you know, my, my uncle lost his temper at his niece and she went back and told her dad and they got angry at one another, there was an argument and it was like that for 10 years. And then one of my uncles passed away of a heart attack, just like that. It's like, such a waste. You know, this, this foolish argument that could have been resolved with humility and, and grace and forgiveness was never resolved. And my, one of my uncles went to his deathbed before it was ever resolved. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because that can happen. Division can go on and on and on. And contrary to what people say, uh, time doesn't heal all wounds. You know what heals all wounds? Forgiveness and grace. The gospel heals all wounds. 
So, what is a friend? We talked about that. Who are your friends? Uh, it's, it's your family. It's those who, who fit that grid of having that spiritual vision for you and speaking the truth in love and compassion. Showing forgiveness and grace. Finally, who's your best friend? Well, you know the answer. Our best friend is Jesus. Proverbs 18, 24 says, One who has unreliable friends will come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Those who are listening today, Redeeming Hope Church family, those listening, watching far and wide, there is a friend who has a vision for your spiritual health. There is a friend that tells you the truth and shows you compassion. There is a friend that sees your flaws and gives you grace. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 15, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Isn't that amazing? Jesus welcomes us as friends. Who knew that God wanted to be our friend? That God would come to this world and become our friend. The Old Testament character Job longed for this friend as he was forward-looking in the midst of his suffering in Job 16 when his, his friends had let him down. He looked forward to another friend that he might have, that he'd hoped would, would stand up for him, that he'd hoped existed in the heavens. He said, Earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend as my eyes pour out tears to God. On behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. So Job was forward-looking to that friend who would come, the intercessor who would plead with God on our behalf. And his intercession took him to the cross and he became our great high priest who resurrected and ascended to heaven and goes before us as our eternal friend. And the amazing thing is Jesus chose us, not when we had it together, but when we didn't. And that's what grace is. It's unearned love. It's unearned favor. Romans 5, 7 and 8. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And if Jesus showed us that kind of love, if the Father showed us that kind of love when we were in sin, how much more is he for us now that we believe? And that's why it says in Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The picture here is, if God gave us the money to build the house, won't he also give us the groceries and the light bulbs? If he's already given the greater gift, wouldn't he give the lesser gift? Since he's already given the best that heaven has in Christ the Son, why wouldn't he give us all things? All things. How do we apply this message? Number one, believe and receive Jesus, that he is your best friend. And he's more than that too, isn't he? He's king, savior, lord, treasure. Number two, ask God to help you to be a friend like Jesus. You look around you at your family. Look around you at the friends that God has brought into your life. Be a friend who has a vision for their spiritual health. Praise for them. Encourages them. A friend, be a friend that tells the truth and shows compassion. Be a friend that sees the flaws of others but gives them grace. You don't cut them off when you see their flaws. And be a friend who is willing, like Jesus, to lay down your life for them. To sacrifice yourself, your time, your resources, your vulnerability for them. So believe that Jesus is your friend. Ask God to help you to be a friend like Jesus. Number three, be the friend to others that you want them to be to you. You know, we're here in this church plant and um, we're still getting to know each other. And I've, as a pastor, over the years, I've seen a number of people who uh, struggle to make friends and, and uh, sometimes we've had people leave because they, 
they said nobody wanted to be my friend or nobody reached out to me. And you can't steer a parked car. So I think it's a good principle that one of the best ways to make friends is to be the friend to others that you want them to be to you. You know, we just had this, uh, in, in uh, Redeeming Hope, we have this greeting time, um, you know, be between worship and, and the message. Well, stretch yourself, get up, walk across the room, meet a couple people, be the friend to others that you want them to be to you. That's, that's good practice, good principle. And you'll find that God uses that to move people toward you and move friends into your life. And finally, just a simple reminder that friendships take time and work, including with your family. So I want to encourage you to remember Christ, remember his love, remember his grace. And that, that's, all, that's, that's the classroom of friendship, isn't it? When we see how Jesus loved us. Let's pray. Father, help us to be the friend to others that we want them to be to us. Help us even to be friendly to our enemies and win people over win their hearts with the love of God. Help us, Lord, to be good friends to the people you have put in our lives, the friends you put in our lives, the siblings, even our spousal relationships, our, our parental child relationships. Help us to grow in our friendship as we grow in the love of God in Christ. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And until next time, remember, Jesus is enough. <laughs>